Hello everybody, I'm Alexey Krabro, the organizer of SF Scala, and we are back at Twitter for the fantastic meetup, which is a part of the Cognitive Frameworks Festival, which is a week-long series of meetups all around the city. Scala and Spark are key parts of this. Scala is the language of data pipelines. And here with us we have Eugene Brumako. Hey guys. Software engineer at Twitter and the author of Scala Macros. Right. So for those of us who missed uh, the talk, uh, or didn't see it yet, uh, can you tell us briefly what are Scala Macros? Okay, sure. Thanks for the great question. Uh, so Scala Macros, uh, it's a language feature that was introduced in Scala 2.10 uh, to support compiled and metaprogramming, which is basically a fancy way of saying uh, that macros are functions that can talk to the compiler, they can analyze the code that is being compiled, and uh, do interesting stuff with it, generate more code, apply advanced validations, and so on and so forth. So please check out uh, my talks for more details. So, uh, you know, people who do programming, they've seen multiple kinds of macros, right? So, you know, our, like, grandparents saw the C macros and CPP proportion macros, yeah. and then people in Lisp have their own macros. Uh, and, uh, and when Sc macros just appeared, in, in Scala, I remember it was horror and terror, and people saying like, Scala is not enterprise ready yet. We need to strengthen up some stuff. Why are you guys going on to the deep end and like playing with more like programming language theory stuff? We need yeah. to really get this stuff into the enterprise. But that didn't work, actually. Scala's macros took cold. We see a lot of use of this. Yeah. You know, nobody is afraid this is going to like uh, make Scala more academic, so people actually love it. So why do you think this became such a useful thing? Um, well, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, actually, today, I think uh, macros, they go along the lines with the headline of Scala, which is basically more power to the users. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks to macros, uh, it's become possible to achieve, uh, well, previously, uh, well, the milestones of expressivity and type safety that were previously outside reach. And uh, as a result, uh, people, people who use macros, thanks to library authors that write macros, they can express uh, their ideas in a very concise manner. That's one of the coolest opportunities that macros provide. One of the examples uh, here would be, you know, the rise of a uh, library called Shapeless, mm -hmm. uh, which allows you to do generic programming, uh, that is to write functions in normal Scala that process uh, different case classes, uh, whatever the shape, hence I guess the name Shapeless. Uh, in a generic fashion. So, for instance, uh, for all business objects, for all case classes in your application, you would be able to generate a serializer without you know, having to duplicate this logic again and again. Okay, and uh, kind of to the nature of Scala macros, right? So obviously, you know, C and C++ macros and Lisp are different. What makes Scala macros kind of better for Scala? All right, uh, well, uh, when I just started at the PFL uh, as a PhD student, I knew about this exotic language on the .NET platform called Nemerle, and uh, I was very inspired by the idea of compile time metaprogramming. And as a result, I just uh, came to Martin Odersky, the creator of the language, my professor, and said, uh, well, look, Martin, we need to do macros. <laughs> so uh, from my side, this was uh, uh, pretty easy, but uh, uh, actually I had to motivate this somehow, because Scala, as you said, is a production language. Mm -hmm. It you know, rushes into enterprise. It's used uh, all over the Silicon Valley. Why are macros useful for mm -hmm. such a language? Well, the special thing about Scala macros is that they can talk with the compiler and uh, with the Scala's type system. And as a result, in comparison with Lisp macros, uh, which are developed for a non-type language, or with C macros, which are basically text substitution, mm -hmm. Scala macros provide a high-level model uh, of compiled time metaprogramming. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, uh, we have uh, pretty unique features, for instance, materializers, which I was also covering in the talk. Uh, which are about uh, generic programming, basically generating code uh, for all possible types and being able to inspect fields of those types, mm -hmm. types of those fields, and so on and so forth. This is something that's uh, impossible in Lisp, impossible in C, and even impossible in template Haskell. So I think uh, that's a signature feature of Scala macros, the fact that they can communicate with the type system. Interesting. Uh, and so uh, Scala is typically used for DSLs, right? And so I think it's a very strong feature of Scala. It's a scalable language. And one thing I've seen people use repeatedly in Spark, they switch from 
Spark SQL to to just Scala, right? And so that, that used to be a big problem with UDFs in in things like Hive, right? Like you have to write your your, your functions in the programming language and then plug into this weird DSL through some very specific glue, right? And 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 uh, DSLs simplify this. Can you talk a little bit how macros basically make it easier for people to create DSLs? Yeah, sure. So uh, uh, there actually uh, has been a dissertation of uh, one of my former colleagues at EPFL that talks about this at length, but I'll, ch I'll, I'll try to condense it. Uh, so basically, Scala's type system is very powerful, and so it can accommodate a lot of compiled and metaprogramming even without macros. So when, when you're doing uh, type-level programming, this is actually a form of compiled and metaprogramming. Mm -hmm. Even though you, you have to use uh, implicits, uh, which is basically a roundabout way of expressing complex logic, still you can do this. And uh, as a result, one simplification to step level programming is using macros to express uh, your logic in straightforward Scala code. Mm -hmm. So uh, one advantage of macros is that uh, they allow you to simplify your DSLs, mm -hmm. and that's pretty cool. Another thing that people uh, often use is uh, additional validations, which are unavailable in the type system. So for instance, a classic example that I keep bringing up over and over during my talks is this poor macro. So Spores, it's, uh, it's a project started by Heather Miller, also my uh, former colleague at APFL. Uh, and uh, it's about verifying closures that they don't capture stuff uh, that you don't want them to. So closures that you want to send over the wire, if they capture, I don't know, a Wikipedia on your machine, you definitely don't want to send it over the wire. And right. As a result, with the macro, you can go through all the parts of the closure, all the abstract syntax trees, all the nodes that uh, compo uh, well, that uh, this code is composed of, and check that you don't capture, you know, this Wikipedia or something like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, just uh, to sum it up, first of all, with macros, it's possible to make the type-based part of DSLs easier, and also with macros, it's possible to go even beyond types to see exactly the structure of the code that's part of the DSL. And I think uh, these are pretty novel opportunities for DSL authors, and definitely over the years many of them have taken advantage of macros. Sounds great. Uh, and uh, you, since you mentioned the PFL and, and uh, academia, and now you're a software engineer tutor, uh, I wonder how does this transition work, right? So on the one hand, you kind of deep in research, yeah. you're on top of research, you, you still advance uh, cutting edge language features. At the same time, you are at the heart of basically the biggest Scala company in the world, a public company, right? Uh, with the biggest Scala base, probably, you know, biggest number of Scala developers. How, how does this transition work for you? You know, how can you compare these two worlds? All right, uh, well, great question. Uh, well, first of all, uh, the transition, it was not this abrupt, uh, because uh, here at Twitter, I still do a lot of research. So uh, thanks uh, to you know the generosity of Twitter, we actually reached an agreement uh, that I can uh, do 50% of my time on open source projects, Scala open source projects of my liking. Mm -hmm. And as a result, what I'm currently working on is uh, the project that we call Scala Meta. Mm -hmm. This is the open source foundation for better tooling. And uh, that's basically my job description here build better tools, semantic tools that can understand the meanings of the programs, mm -hmm. uh, talk to the type system and the compiler. So here you probably can see parallels between my previous research mm -hmm. and uh, this. So as you can see, it's not that different. So previously I was pushing the boundaries, you know, with Scala macros, with this uh, feature that's built into the compiler. Mm -hmm. Now it's tools, but still the same profile. Got it. Like high order Scala <laughs> for the organization. Because uh, the Twitter is big enough, right? So you have enough kind of uh, uh, primary level, so we can go meta level, right? And yeah, so uh, actually we have an entire department uh, called E Engineering Effectiveness, which uh, makes sure that uh, all the Scala developers here, not just Scala developers, uh, we also handle Python, Git, well, quite a diverse bunch. So we make sure that everyone is operating at, uh, well, at their optimal effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And as a result, definitely there's need for better tools in Scala. Still, we as a community suffer from this problem. And uh, here's where we can make a difference with applied research. Great. Right, so you mentioned open source and community kind of uh, is the heart of open source. And uh, I recall that you know when you just started Twitter, you spoke at the Scala by the Bay conference, which we held in November. And this November we're coming back with Scale by the Bay, which is an even bigger conference where you know Scala is the heart of this. But we talk about end-to-end -end data pipelines. We talk about data, right? So uh, I just wonder what was your experience. 
uh, speaking at Scala by the Bay, why would you recommend people uh, speak at Scala by the Bay? What kind of talks do you think are most useful to you and other folks in the community? Mm -hmm. Any impressions of, of the conference? All right, uh, so indeed, uh, it was a great event in November. So actually, uh, I was giving a talk exactly the next day after I moved uh, to San Francisco. <laughs> that was pretty crazy. Uh, but anyway, uh, I digress. Uh, well, all in all, it was a super streamlined event, and I was very glad that it was organized at Twitter, at my new employer. So we actually had an entire floor dedicated uh, to us, to speakers, and to the mm -hmm. attendees. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed the, the event very much because uh, it was quite diverse, uh, you know, so a lot of topics in the community. Uh, they were presented there. So unlike some conferences which are focused on academia or, you know, maybe on some super practical uh, things like ACA, Lightband Stack, this was a really great mix. And personally for me it was interesting to know the, uh, about the advances in tooling. So I was giving a talk about uh, Scala Meta based macros. So macros again and mm -hmm. Scala Meta again. And uh, it was great uh, to learn more about you know, the uh, adventures in the monorepo mono uh, style of development given by my colleague uh, Stu Hood uh, at Twitter. And, uh, well, in general, it was a great opportunity to socialize with decision makers in the community, for instance. Adrian Morse, uh, the Scala uh, compiler team, team lead from Lightband was there. Uh, I think Miles Sabin as well. Yep, he so, can hold it. Yeah, it was... Uh, it was really cool to be able to talk directly to them and to see what's coming up next. Because actually that's a rare opportunity. Uh, even though, uh, well, we're here in the Silicon Valley, at the very heart of what uh, some would say Scala development, you know, the industry, Scala-based industry. But still, it is rare to, to, to chat with these people face to face and, uh, well, we definitely love this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, description. So, uh, kind of looking into the future, what would you like to see more at this conference? Uh, right? How community can make it even better, and how do you think we can make it better better for Twitter? Because I work with different folks at Twitter. I want to expose different pieces of Twitter. So, what would be from like a meta level, mm -hmm. Scala meta, uh, most useful for us to do, both uh, from the outside and from Twitter side? All right, um, let's see. I think, uh, well, for me, coming from uh, you know the research community, the cutting edge of Scala development, I think it would be great uh, to have more coverage of uh, recent trends. For instance, Dari is pretty big, and uh, mm -hmm. the last week in Copenhagen, Scala Days Copenhagen, Martin Andersky, the creator of the language, announced the first uh, preview release of Dari. So mm -hmm. everyone's uh, really curious about what's in there because it contains a lot of new features. So it would be great to, to get coverage uh, of something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, also, on the tooling side, while well, I'm the tooling person, it would be cool to get uh, different perspective from the communities uh, because, uh, uh, well, in the Silicon Valley, uh, Silicon Valley is the home probably biggest Scala users in the world. And uh, I presume that every such organization, they encounter some problems mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, well, with scale and Scala beyond, you know, just uh, 10K lines of code or something like this. Mm -hmm. That would be something interesting uh, personally for me. And uh, well, as I mentioned before, it's great to socialize with people like Martin Oderski or Adrian Morse. And uh, if we could, uh, could uh, get them on board, that would be wonderful. I, well, I really enjoy the opportunity to socialize with them because yeah, I used to work in the next office uh, to Martin Oderski's office, and now we rarely get to chat together. That would be a cool opportunity. Martin, I hope you are seeing this, and we are really welcoming you to San Francisco anytime. So uh, Adrian is local, so I'm pretty sure we're going to get Adrian. Uh, it's very interesting on the Scala tooling, so kind of end-to-end -end tooling around Scala, right? From engineering, effectiveness, IDEs, yeah, and, and the life cycle, then to kind of organization, deployment, yes. quality control, testing, mm -hmm. right? So the whole thing. I think this is actually very uh, kind of key part of Scala culture, right? Because people really care yeah. about this stuff. That's so right. I, I agree that I think I'd like to see more of this, and I know for sure that we have, you know, Verizon folks, Mm -hmm. who take it very seriously and they talk about Scala DevOps at HashiConf yeah. and other things, right? So I'm pretty sure we're going to get some of these talks. But if you guys want to submit more talks on your tooling, please do so. The CFP is still open. Scale.bythebay.io. Please submit great talks and hope to see you there. And uh, thank you, thank you, Eugene. That was really, really good. Thanks, Alex. Thanks.